Um, our, our next speaker is Patrick Russell. Um, Patrick's a portfolio manager and director at North Cape Capital based in Melbourne. So we're really changing the pace a bit here. We've gone from a high level and we're now digging deep inside the portfolios. Patrick's got over 30 years experience as a portfolio manager and is the an analyst at the um, Emerging Markets Equity Fund that we've used at the DMG Diversified Portfolio since we set it up over five years ago. Before joining North Cape, Patrick worked at uh, Merrill Lynch for 18 years up to 2007. At Merrill Lynch, Patrick was a managing director with Global Emerging Markets team and was the head of the Asia Pacific team um, head, looking into telecom and, and media stocks. Prior to joining Merrill Lynch, Patrick worked at uh, London as an equity analyst and prior to that for the New Zealand government. He's got a Bachelor of Commerce degree, majoring, majoring in economics um, from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. He's completed a postgraduate study in developing country economics in New Zealand and also has completed um, investment analyst studies from the University of Otago in New Zealand. His favourite TV show is Grand Designs, somewhat like the portfolios he designs, we hope. His uh, favourite music is classical jazz guitar with the vocals. Um, his musical instrument, he can actually play the violin, so it's nice. Um, and also his major sporting achievement is for him was to win a father and son golf tournament um, earlier this year. So there's a picture of Patrick with his son. I'm not sure who made the major contribution, but we'll leave Patrick to tell us that. So please welcome Patrick Russell. Well, thanks, uh, Gary. Very kind words indeed. Um, so I've got the uh, task of uh, talking about uh, emerging markets. Um, and what I'd, I'd like to do is just sort of come in uh, at a very high level and first of all just talking about emerging markets, defining the category and then sort of bringing it to the close, giving an example of you know, one of the investments that you actually own uh, in the funds to sort of um, put some real life uh, into the um, asset class at which you're investing in. So um, why emerging markets? Um, the big thing is it is the world population. Um, and when we talk emerging markets, we're talking basically all the countries away from the developed, the 20 developed countries of the world, the OECD, um, which is about 85% of the population. And it's quite good to realise that the world just keeps growing. And although we've got this volatility at the moment, the sun will still come up tomorrow. People will still eat, drink, buy cars, go on holidays. This consumption and growth of the world continues. And we, we, we very much say, you know, stay very fixed on that in terms of the opportunity of investing. Okay, so you get the fluctuations, but the real economy is, is growing because there is more people on the planet. Um, 2000, there were six billion people. Uh, there's gonna be eight by 2021. We're adding two billion. Uh, and nine billion by 2040. This is incredible. We, you know, the, 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 the world is growing. We know Melbourne, you know, the Monash Freeway is a live example of that. But there's a lot of economic activity is required to correct that, and that's opportunities uh, for investment. And it is significant in EM, the amount of investment you have to make to, to satisfy the population growth. 83 million a year is added to the world. Now, all of that is in EM, okay? In the developed world, our population pyramids are flat or in many cases inverted, okay? So today, 91% of the population below the age of 24 is in EM. 91% below the age of 24. So you think over the next 20 years where the next consuming class is going to come from, where the next big conveyor belt of consumers are going to come from. They're going to come from EM. They're already there. Our consumption is actually going to shrink because the population in 
developed world is mature. Now, unless we have immigration and bring people in from EM to advanced economies, these population pools are going to go into decline and those markets are going to contract. Now, there's a political movement against that, which is growing. So therein lies a big conundrum, is that in places like Germany, they need people to grow that economy, but the, the locals don't want them there. Well, good luck with that. Because at the end of the day, you need people to be born, grow, educated, get a job, and then have aspiration to consume. That's buy a car, set up a household, all that's wonderful stuff for the economy. And I think the important thing here is in EM, you've got that massive tailwind behind you over the longer term of that big profile of consumption uh, coming through. So that is why you need to invest in EM. Just simple and purely that chart. And this little cheesecake here is just going to get more and more closed in uh, over the next 20 years. So if we look at the stock markets in terms of defining the population and where it is in the world, we've got here um, the developed markets, uh, and then all of this here is where the 85% of the population is. But uh, in terms of investing, uh, this is the sweet spot, EM. And the reason why you don't want to be in Frontier, and this is an asset class, but in here, you've got problems with convertibility of your currency. You can't actually get the investment in and out unless you actually apply to some sort of uh, central authority. And that's important for us because if you want to redeem your money, we would have a problem getting it out of those countries. So we focus on these countries here where you've got uh, convertibility of, of the, the currency and we can get our money in and out of those stock markets if we need to. Uh, and that's why you've got the EM uh, asset class per se, is that those countries qualify uh, simply and purely on the convertibility of their currency. There are a raft of other factors, but the bottom line, it's that. And that's the one that you want to be in to get the flexibility. And by the way, those countries there, as you look at LATAM, uh, you've got Asia, and then you've got Central, Eastern Europe and Africa, is around about 80% of the 85. So it's the largest part uh, of the asset class that you're addressing. So what is the risk uh, that we face investing in these countries? It's called failed state syndrome. Uh, and this is where you lose all your money, not because the stock market goes down, it's actually you see a currency collapse, okay? Now, how does this happen, how, and how can we avoid it? It, ha it does happen, and the, the biggest example we've had probably over the last 20 years is Argentina, but there's been a lot of others. But Argentina was actually quite a wealthy country. Um, and then all of a sudden, you got a populist government into power, and they started to spend money on social programs, which is fine but then they just kept on spending and spending and spending. Then there was a terms of trade shock, i.e. agricultural prices fell, tax revenues dropped, they had a massive fiscal deficit. So the president walked down to the central bank and said to the governor of the central bank, start printing money now, and you're going to monetize my fiscal deficit by printing money. Now, if you're a non-reserve currency and you start printing money, and there's only really four reserve currencies in the world, the pound, the euro, the US dollar, and the yen. So they can print money to monetize their deficits, and we've seen that through this unprecedented amount of QE. But if you're a non-reserve currency, like the Australian dollar, or in this example, the Argentine peso, you start printing money, you basically debase your currency very rapidly and you get caught in what is uh, commonly referred to as an inflation uh, devaluation death spiral. 
So we look very closely at these countries we're investing in to understand what is the institutional and legal framework around the central bank. That's critical to understanding whether you're going to put yourself in the way of what we call a failed state. So we could have shares in Argentina and they might be fine in local currency, in Argentine peso, but in our functional currency, which is a US dollar based asset, it's a wipe. So what actually happened to Argentina was actually thrown out of the emerging markets um, asset class. And anyone who invests in that market lost virtually all their money. So when we look at EM, it's an opportunity uh, of vast riches and you can get terrific returns. But also there are some icebergs in there that we have to navigate around uh, in order to meet our requirement of you know, protecting the downside uh, in our investments and that's very much um, at the forefront of what we do. And this is the team uh, at North Cape. Um, it's a small team but we're very, very focused. Um, we cover a, a huge amount of ground and we travel quite a lot into these uh, countries and we do all our field research our own uh, on the ground. I've just come back from China, I arrived back on Sunday. Uh, Cameron here is currently uh, researching in uh, Malaysia. Doug is in India as we speak. Uh, and Ross is uh, currently in Korea. So there's actually only Tom and myself uh, at present in the Melbourne office. So what are our investment principles and how are we able to create uh, an investment where we get that downside protection which is so critical to preserving capital over the long term whilst capturing the upside. And we have these uh, five principles of downside protection and we really focus on corporate governance. This is critical. We find companies with really good corporate governance, these businesses are run very tightly, disciplined, okay? They make good decisions, they have information systems there that create an operating platform that is very strong. So they have elevated levels of customer service, better product quality, better staff morale. The whole business just spins and runs much better. And as a result of that, they just get better returns, financial returns. We find companies with poor corporate governance are clumsy, accident prone, they're vulnerable to corruption, uh, they may have product defects, morale is weaker, so staff turnover is higher, it's very costly. So we put an extraordinary amount of premium on investing in companies with outstanding uh, corporate governance. We also want companies that are not controlled by the government, but are owned by private individuals, and they own a big stake in the business. So your investment is aligned with theirs. And then we invest in companies with literally no debt. Okay, and that's quite rare. But most of our businesses that we invest in are debt free. And this is uh, a little bit different to advanced. I mean, you'll hear from private equity and other, you can run with higher debt levels. They might be investing in markets where um, there's a higher degree of liquidity, but in EM there isn't. And when you get a, a shock, the whole capital market literally goes into cardiac arrest. You can't raise money, and if you're carrying too much debt, you end up selling the beachfront property at the bottom of the market, fire sale. And that's permanent capital loss from which you'll never, ever recover. We're on the other side of that. We own the really high quality companies that are very, very liquid. They've got cash when no one else has and they go in and buy those trophy assets at fire sale prices. That's how you get serious intergenerational wealth creation. And that happens in EM because it's volatile and the markets aren't as well capitalised as what we have in Australia, the US or Europe. So you put that together with our ability to price sovereign risk and we get this really strong foundation of the business, okay? governance, defendable business, strong alignment with management, really good balance sheet. Then we look for the upside, the gold, and that comes from 
businesses generating high returns on capital, 20 plus percent, and they've got good opportunities to reinvest in the business. We're not necessarily attracted to companies that are doing M&A deals all the time. They're just besotted with running the business better and better and better. It might be like running this restaurant here, just getting it better and better and better. That's a sign of a good business. And then acquisitions, they're opportunistic and they wait for markets to be depressed and asset prices to be incredibly cheap, then they buy. Those are the kind of businesses that we want to own uh, in EM and we populate them in our portfolio. And they're addressing those really large markets so they get that beautiful tailwind of demand, just more and more people joining their marketplace and just naturally growing their addressable opportunity. And that's those ever enlarging population pools. So you put all that together and there's no reason why this business won't double and double and double and double and double again over the long run. This is time in the market, not timing the market, but just investing in outstanding businesses uh, in the emerging markets. And that's what we do. We put the portfolio together of these businesses and we just watch them very, very tightly. We only have the one fund, we don't have multiple funds, we just have the one emerging market fund and that's what we live, eat and breathe. So how do we embed that into our process? Well, we see our universe of around 5,000 stocks. People say, well, gee, that's an extraordinary amount of stocks for a group of five people to try and filter down to a portfolio of 38. But we use a number of screens to do that, um, looking at things like uh, balance sheet, looking at industry themes, financial metrics, governance, liquidity and so on. And then we go out to the field and see 400 companies a year. And from there, we look, do they comply with our eight principles? If not, forget it, move on. And uh, that way we can get through an extraordinary amount of uh, research in terms of the field. So those are the uh, countries that we see uh, on an every year and you can see it's an extraordinary amount of field research we put in. And this is the process we do. Uh, the opportunity screening, looking at the 5,000 countries, then we do the ESG test to make sure that they do have uh, really high levels of governance. And if they pass that test, then they go into our approval list. They're available for investment in the portfolio. So that process takes a year. So there's no kind of, we see the company on a Tuesday and it's in the portfolio on a Thursday. You get that kind of rush of blood. Like someone says, hey, I've got a hot tip for a stock and within two days you've bought it. We take nearly a year before we pull the trigger. So we get on the plane, we fly to Brazil, um, we put the backpack on, we go and look at their operations. We really go deep because this is a very hand-picked, highly selective strategy. We haven't got like 400 stocks, so if one doesn't perform, it doesn't matter. We've, we've got a lot of uh, concentration in our portfolio and we just want the best of the best. And it takes time, if you really want to uh, have full confidence in an investment, taking that amount of time and effort gives you more conviction. It's like the more you know and the more you've shopped around to buy a property, if you've taken a few years to do it, the one that you finally do, you go, yep, I know I've, got, I've nailed this. I haven't just gone out on a Tuesday and bought the paper and you know, bought a property on the Friday. I mean, you might do well, but it might be a, an element of luck. So the final thing we do, and I've got to sum up here, is on how do we manage so sovereign risk. We rank the 21 countries from the most preferred to least preferred and essentially, this cohort is more resilient to a shock than this. And you can see, you've actually got countries like China, Brazil, and Russia, uh, some of the bigger countries are actually in our least preferred list. We have actually have some different kind of countries that we think are less vulnerable to a shock. And often it's got nothing to do with growth. We actually come back to things, is the central bank actually truly independent? 
do they have corporate law and is it prosecutable through an independent judiciary? These are actually really important factors for protecting an investment for a foreign shareholder such as ourselves. And those are the kind of things that we do. And then we rank those countries. So we will invest in China, but we, we apply a very high discount rate or a low PE, if you like. If that same company was domiciled in India, Korea, or Taiwan, we'd actually put a much higher PE or a lower discount. So it means we can invest in these higher risk countries, but we want to be compensated by way of a much cheaper valuation for those kind of risks that we're going to put our clients in front of. So just to sum up, you know, what would be a good stock in the portfolio to show one is Maruti Suzuki. You may not have heard of this. This is the leading auto company uh, in India. And the reason we like it is that car ownership in India is only at 3% of the population. In Australia, it's 70. So that's 70 cars per 100 people. In India, it's three. Now, India is building roads like crazy. Um, it's been slow for a long time, but it's really now starting to pick up a head of steam. And we see uh, this kind of geometry of car penetration growing quite dramatically in India over the next 10 or 20 years. And what Maruti has got is this wonderful set of cars that, this is 800cc, cost 4,000 US dollars. I mean, you, you don't see it in Australia. It runs on the smell of an oily rag but it, it's, a, it's a thing of beauty because it can go anywhere in India. It's rugged, it's skinny, so it can sneak down laneways, and it's cheap, cheap to run, and it's got a beautiful resale value. It is the number one car, and it, 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 it can't be beaten by anyone else. And on top of that, Maruti has built an unrivaled distribution system in India. Now, we've done some field research trying to estimate the size of the number of service bays they have right across the subcontinent, and they've got 10,000. These are little mechanics out there that exclusively service Maruti's cars, and this is their competition down the bottom. Nowhere to be seen. And they've painstakingly built that up over 50 years. That is a competitive advantage unparalleled in any country in the world. And now what you're seeing is their market share is just continuing to rise. Now I remember we've invested in this company for a long time. Everyone said, oh, they can't get more than 38% market share. That's on a global basis, that's impossible. Uh, by 2018, their market share will be 20%. Well, it's actually 53. It's 50 here, but they've added another. It, it, it's just a phenomenal business. And it's because they have built a phenomenal platform of distribution and have got the right car. Plus, they don't have any debt. And this is the returns it's created. Since 2003, this, the stock has compounded at 29% per annum. And it's only just got started. It's only got started. I'll leave you with this statistic. Today, there's about 45 to 50 million cars in India. There's 1.3 billion. Now, we think that penetration ultimately could go to 10%, which is, if you look at uh, two-wheelers or motorbikes, which is around 20%. So that means the total car market could go to 20 million units uh, a year in sales. Today, it's four. Now, if they've got 50 million, or 50%, they'll be selling 10 million cars a day from the current 2 million. That's five times as much. So this is a company that's currently making around 500 million US in profit. They will get some margin gain on that. So it's quite possible that the profit pool on that company will go from 500 million to maybe five to eight billion over a 15-year period. So what will happen to the market value of that company, of that stock? You think about it. So we have a portfolio riddled with those kind of opportunities. Yes, you get a little bit of volatility from now and then. In fact, we've been buying Maruti of late because it has been sold off a little bit. 
But I'll leave you with it. that's the kind of opportunities you can get in EM, but it's, it's, it's really the aim for us is to get those without putting yourself in front of undue risk. So I'll leave it there.